Welcome. Today what we're learning about are mixtures, heterogeneous mixtures to be specific. If you think back to when we thought about these heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures, they were times when we were classifying matter, like the CO2 up here. CO2 is classified as a compound. Or aluminum. We classified this first semester as aluminum as an element. We've got balloons here. When at first glance I look at the balloons, they've got all different parts. They've got the string, and they've got the latex of the balloon, and the inside air. And I would say that that's a heterogeneous mixture. But if we look more closely and just look at the air inside of the balloon, I would say air, like air in this room, looks the same everywhere. So it's homogeneous mixtures. And first semester, I would look at clouds, and I would say, well, the clouds themselves have you know, dust particles in there. I don't know if they're heterogeneous or homogeneous, if they're a mixture that looks the same everywhere. You kind of go either way with that one with clouds. And milk. When I first look at milk, I'm thinking, definitely homogeneous. It looks the same everywhere. But in fact, the clouds and the milk aren't homogeneous mixtures at all. We need a little more information and definition for these. What we're going to be learning about today and into tomorrow is comparing and contrasting types of heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures. So far we've looked at, only looked at heterogeneous versus homogeneous. Now we're looking at the different types. So this was the chart that we had before. We looked at pure substances versus mixtures. We classified into heterogeneous and homogeneous. What I want to do is just look at the right side, the heterogeneous, homogeneous side. If I just hone in on that, you can see I've got two more groups going underneath that. Suspensions and colloids. I still got my homogeneous over there, but the two new terms that we're going to be talking about today are suspensions and colloids. They're types of heterogeneous mixtures. So let's get started on suspensions. That's why I put it in red. Suspensions are those mixtures that separate out if you let them settle enough. The particles in suspensions and heterogeneous mixtures are large particles. When you think about solutions, they're very small particles. Heterogeneous has to be larger particles, so the particles that are larger than atoms. The most classic example, I think, is sandy water. If you have a glass of sandy water and you kind of swirl it, you can suspend the sand in there. But then eventually, if you stop swirling it, the sand will settle to the bottom. It's a suspension. It is suspended for a moment in time, but it will settle out eventually. That settling out allows us to filter it. And that's what we use filter paper for a lot, in the lab especially. So the filter paper will catch the larger particles, the larger than atoms particles, because they can't fit through the filter paper. So a suspension can be filtered. All right, so that takes care of the suspension side, one type of heterogeneous mixture. Another type of heterogeneous mixture would be a colloid. A colloid has particles that kind of range in size. So you have homogeneous solutions, which are really, really tiny. You have suspensions, which are a little bit bigger. And then you have colloids, which are even a little bit bigger. They can't be filtered or settle, or settle out. So although they have big particles, you still can't run them through filter paper, which seems kind of funny until you look at some examples of them. Clouds are an example of colloids. They have large particles, and it kind of looks the same everywhere, but it's really not. Marshmallows are also an example of colloids. They have the gases inside that are kind of suspended of sorts inside the marshmallow. Milk is the most classic type of colloid. It's got large proteins inside of it and different fats. Um, um, and all those parts are being suspended in a way, but you can't filter out. If you let milk settle long enough, it won't filter out towards the bottom. Butter, another example. So you notice that colloids don't just have to be solution sort of things, liquid sorts of things. They can be solids, liquids, or gases. A whipped cream is kind of a mixture of gases. Notice we're on a dairy theme here, of gases and liquids and solids all kind of put together. Mayonnaise, a classic also. And smoke. All of these things are examples of colloids. And I think when we look at how a colloid stays together, you'll be able to see what this means. So colloids stay together, I mean, you have to think of it, they're really large particles that are dispersed inside of this medium. So they use these terms like dispersion medium, which is all of the parts, and dispersed particles are inside the dispersion medium. That's a lot of dispersion in my, in my book. But what's happening is that you have these large particles which have plus and minus ends because they're polar, or they might have charge groups, or they have some sort of attracting and repelling groups. And these groups can be suspended or dispersed inside of these dispersion medium because they're continually repelled up in the air. Take a look at this video. 
the dispersed particle is the blue one. And it looks like all the red dispersion medium is hitting it. But really what they're doing isn't, you know, when you have like two balls and you're juggling them, you hit them up in the air. Well, particles don't actually hit because you don't really want two nuclei hitting each other. But what they're doing is they might have a negative part around this blue circle and a negative red part. And those two parts are getting close to each other and then repelling each other back. So this blue sphere, the dispersed particle, can never fall to the bottom because it's always being hit up in the air. So colloids stay together because of Brownian motion, this idea where you can keep them up in the air by repelling the particles. Okay, so what if we want to make the colloids separate out? You can't filter them, that's a, a suspension, but there are two things you can do. You can add heat. Uh, if you think about what's going on in a colloid with a Brownian motion, they're holding it up in the air, you know, by repelling. Now what if the particles are going faster? It's like a juggler getting thrown more and more balls to keep up in the air, or they have to be able to juggle faster. A juggler juggling the same amount of balls but faster, you can understand how that probably may not work and he might drop all the balls. That's kind of what happens with heat. So you're trying to repel things, but then eventually things are moving so fast that you don't have enough moment in time to repel, and then repel, and then repel. You're moving so fast that that repelling isn't happening for a long enough time, and so that is eventually going to settle out the colloid into different parts. If you think about milk, milk can be made into cheese. And when you make cheese, you heat it. And that's because the colloid pieces, like the proteins inside of the milk, are being kept up perfectly in the milk. But then eventually, it'll settle out when the heat is applied, because the big protein parts can't be repelled enough, and they'll settle out towards the bottom. So one way we can separate a colloid is by heat. Uh, another way we can separate colloid, a heterogeneous mixture, is by adding a matchmaker. This matchmaker term is my term. Lots of times they're called enzymes, but they don't have to be enzymes. So I'm going to keep to the matchmaker part. If you think about these colloids, like those blue circles, you can have a matchmaker that will take one blue circle and the other blue circle and stick it together. Now you have two blue circles together. That's a lot heavier for this repelling to stay up in the air, and it won't stay up in the air. It'll eventually settle out. Matchmakers will match up the dispersed parts so that they can settle to the bottom. Okay, so we've got these heterogeneous mixtures. How can we tell if it's clear, or like you know, clouds and smoke and things like that, how can you tell if it's heterogeneous or homogeneous? I mean, milk looks the same everywhere. How can we know that milk, without investigating further in milk, is actually heterogeneous and not homogeneous like we think? And we'd have to use the Tyndall effect. The Tyndall effect is the scattering of light in all directions. So if you take a look at the image, you can see that's a humidifier, and it's shooting out mist or steam. Um, it's trying to create humidity in the room. And if you shoot a laser through it, you can see you can't see the laser through regular air. And then suddenly, you can see the laser going through the humid part, because the humid part is going to be a uh, heterogeneous mixture. The air part, you can't see the laser. It has a negative Tyndall effect. It is homogeneous. The humid part, you can see the laser positive Tyndall effect, it's a heterogeneous mixture. So if you can see the laser, it's got to be a suspension or a colloid, because those are two types of heterogeneous mixtures. Okay, so we've kind of covered mixtures on one side. We've got heterogeneous mixtures, suspensions and colloids done. When you come to class, I'm going to have you look at homogeneous mixtures. So please, don't forget to answer the questions on the Google form, so we can go further into comparing and contrasting heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures. Bring your questions.